Hi, good morning, wherever you might be. Welcome to this teaching called The Echoes of Exodus from Plague to Promise. Before we begin, I would ask that we take a moment of silence. I'd ask that you prepare your heart to hear, your ears to listen. If you're distracted right now, uh, may you come back to this video at a different time. Uh, I believe that this video, this revelation that I'm going to share is of great encouragement to our humanity, and I think it deserves uh, attention because it has to deal with the great transformation that is happening upon the earth right now, and I want to give some context to that by sharing about some exodus events and how we are in a new exodus. So I'm just going to take a few moments of silence if you would join with me. And again, if you're not ready for this, please just stop the video at this point and come back to it at a different time. So just a few moments of silence. Thank you. Of course, the inner silence is what I am referring to. You'll be able to calm down and to listen. Um, as I'm outside in my backyard, you'll hear sounds like construction sounds way in the background and also the nature sounds of, of birds. So we're in a natural environment. So I want to talk about um, this echoes of, of Exodus, as I am calling it, and try to give context to some old stories and hear those echoes that have been reverberating down to our day and to how uh, we are experiencing a kind of exodus. We are experiencing a great opportunity to uh, partner and participate in a great shift that God has been, always been trying to get us to wake up to. And we especially need it in a time when people do not know how to rest, people don't know how to slow down, and there's various reasons for that. And many of those reasons are being shaken as we face a worldwide pandemic of this COVID-19. And so it's very interesting that in one of the Exodus accounts, we're going to talk about a plague. This could be likened to a plague. Now, to be very clear, I do not think that this COVID-19 is from God, but I do believe that God uses everything for our good, even our own dysfunctions and uh, evil in the world. God will always use that for good, and we see that throughout history if we have the eyes to see it. But I want to make it clear that I don't believe that this plague is from God. But before we get into uh, the Exodus story that deals with a plague, I would like to go to an Exodus story that happened before that. And it's a good example. There was this man named Joseph. Some of you would be familiar with this if you have read this in ancient text or had teaching on it. And this man, Joseph, uh, was younger and had a dream. And this dream made his brothers jealous. And they felt like Joseph was um, arrogant, that who, who would they be to bow down to somebody who was younger, who has such revelation and vision. And so what they decide to do is to uh, kind of take their brother, sell him into slavery to Egypt, and uh, make up a story that he was killed. Uh, and so they go back to the father and they spread the lie. Now in the story, Joseph is in prison in Egypt and eventually is uh, makes his way because he can interpret dreams. He's, he's a revelatory person. He begins to eventually interpret dreams for Pharaoh, the great ruler of Egypt who um, uh, nobody could could give understanding to what his dreams were were about. 
Essentially, uh, Joseph rises to power because of this revelation gift and how he serves this Pharaoh. And we have to think about it, think about it from Joseph's standpoint. He probably felt like he was abandoned not only by his brothers, but maybe his father was in on the whole deal. So when he was sold into the slavery, he's now gone through this trial and, and ru- arisen to prominence and Pharaoh essentially becomes like a father to him and, uh, and a leader. Uh, the story goes on where eventually um, there's a great famine which he had predicted in, in his dreams uh, and the famine in the land causes his family to have to come to Egypt to, to try to get food. Uh, there's an exchange as he sees his brothers come before him. Uh, he, he learns in the discussion that his father could not bear to, to lose other sons and, and basically he has this awakening moment that his father still loves him, his father still cares for him. And so essentially he reveals himself and you know the dream that he had does come true. The, the brothers came and bowed down before him but of course he said that you know what you meant for evil God has used for good. And that is a great narrative to remember in this time, that what other people use for evil, God uses for good. And essentially, the father of Joseph had a promise from God that there was a promised land, and it was not in Egypt. The promised land was in Canaan. It was in a different location. And so he made his son swear to him that he would bury him in this promised land to make sure that this promise that God would rise up a nation of people would be fulfilled through this lineage that they would not remain in Egypt. Now this is very important because we're going to get into the symbolism of Egypt. You know, Egypt was a a, a culturally dominant culture uh, worldwide, you know, an empire if you will, much like we might find ourselves today in some of the nations of the world. And what's so interesting about, you know, empires is that the way that they, they do life, when it, begets, when it becomes so big, often misses the human dignity of, of who we are as humans. And we eventually see this because um, it was ba- they basically understood that there was going to have to be another exodus. There would have to be another movement out of Egypt, which leads us to our second exodus story. And this is the one that many people are are familiar with. And this is where this Pharaoh rises up who forgets Joseph, doesn't really know about Joseph. And he rises to power. And basically the promises of of these Israelites, you know, as they become known later, um, they are in bondage. They are in slavery to this Pharaoh. And uh, God raises up uh, some deliverers and Moses and Aaron to come and speak and say, hey, let these people go. These are, these are God's people. Let them go and, and worship in, in the wilderness. And um, there starts this pro- progression of events where this Pharaoh does not, you know, he hardens his heart and he just doesn't listen. And you have to give context to this because this Pharaoh in that culture is very powerful. He can control people, obviously. He has slaves. He has military might. And um, in Egypt, they believed in many different gods. So as Moses comes and tells them about uh, a different god, the one true god, if you will, you know, this is not news necessarily to Pharaoh. He, he believes in, in, in other gods, so he's probably just testing, you know, well, well let's, let's see what this god is all about. So essentially, uh, we see this progression of events, and this Pharaoh is uh, at one point finally acknowledging that there is some God. There is this creator God that he had, um, he had sinned, he had sort of um, come to some kind of awareness. But shortly after that, he hardens his heart even more. Because when you have power and when you have influence and when you have slaves, it's very hard to let go of that ego game because you feel powerful. And who would you be if you didn't have slaves? Who would you be, listen carefully, 
if your economic system did not function to provide the lifestyle that you enjoy. Okay, see now we're starting to get somewhere. So essentially, uh, these plagues are sent and, and God is trying to get these people to go. He's trying to get Pharaoh. He, you know, we, we, we are familiar with the story today, but it didn't have to be that way. It, he could have just said, you know what, this is true, I'm going to let these people go. That could have happened. Just because it happened that he uh, rebelled and sort of did not let these people go, it didn't have to happen that way. Don't be so fixed in your stories to think it has to happen a certain way. So anyways, the story goes on, and we get to uh, one of the final plagues. And in the final plague, it reminds us of today, uh, essentially this, this angel of death is going to come throughout the land, and it's going to kill the firstborns of those who do not have the blood of um, these lambs or goats, whatever, on the doorpost. Famous story interesting context here. Why, why would this be happening in that culture? Well, you have to understand that people in power, um, Pharaoh had done this before, had already tried to kill all the firstborns. You know, he had, this, this, is all, this has been done throughout history. You try to kill the youth. You try to kill the babies that are coming forth because um, they are part of a promise. And if they rise up to be too strong, just naturally, they can overthrow you physically. And so we see this as basically um, Pharaoh reaping what all evil uh, people do. They, they, they reap what they sow. And so God was trying to wake people up from this system and say, hey, I'm trying to get people out of that system that needs to kill babies, that needs to, to sacrifice to gods, that needs to do all these sort of things. So just remember the context so you understand how radical this is. The other interesting thing about this context is the people who, who God was trying to free were, um, they didn't have to do anything with the other plagues. They didn't have to do anything. But with this final plague, they were asked to put the blood on the doorpost. They were asked to participate. And this is very important because this is the same call that's happening today that happens throughout time is we are called to participate, to co-create, to wake up to a larger story and come out of the slavery dynamics of our cultures. And um, we see this happening today uh, in this moment as the economic systems have, have been shaken up. We have been forced into a Passover. It's very interesting that this is all happening, the time that the, the Jewish people celebrate this very event, a Passover, we've been uh, stuck in our homes, you know, for for this for this time, this quarantine, and um, there's just a powerful similarity to what is happening. But the key here is that we're called to participate, because essentially, when we say, you know, what, we're going to put the blood on, God did not need; they didn't have to put the blood on the doorposts. Like, okay, you didn't do it, you're going to die. The point of the story is that. I want you to wake up and to consciously participate in the story, acknowledging that I am the creator, that I am good, that I am for you, and that I, w I don't want you to be slaves, and I don't want you to be um, rulers like Pharaoh who oppress people. Um, think about it this way, who, who don't pay them well, who don't give them uh, good living, who don't give them access to health care. This is the dynamic that we're facing today in the shakeup. I don't want you to be like that. I want you to come out from among that. I want you to be a new community, a new people who live from rest, who live from peace, that are not machines, that are not you know, doing brick after brick after brick. And so the, the plague comes, and of course the people who participate see a great deliverance, and they finally get to go into the wilderness. Pharaoh finally you know, relents. Now the interesting thing, and this is very important, for our day to day in the context of these echoes back then of, e uh, of this exodus is that once they leave into the wilderness, once they begin to finally uh, come out from among that burden and make a journey forward, Pharaoh is like, you know what, this can't happen. W what is going to happen to my economy now that these people are resting? Like, 
I'm going to lose my power and and the the machine of these humans that I've used to produce uh, my wealth and, and and make this society function. I don't have that anymore. This can't be. We have to go get them. We have to. And if and if if they won't come back, well, at least I'll kill them because I need my power, right? So this is what happens in the story. Now, what's happening in this day? As we are in a type of Passover and a type of Exodus out, many systems have fallen. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everything is, is corrupt. There, there are beautiful businesses. There are, there are people who treat people well. There are beautiful, essential things that we need, and we need to do them better. So it's not just like everything. But there are a lot of systems that are like Pharaoh. And they oppress people, and they, they, they work crappy jobs, and they don't get paid very well, or they just get treated as they're replaceable, all these sort of dynamics. These are all lies that humans believe that basically rob the dignity of who we are as people created in God's image. And so as this exodus is happening now, put yourself in the story where you are today. Think about the pharaohs that are trying to get people to come back into the system. Like, we can't have this. We need, we need our brick builders. We need this again, you know? And so, as these people are leaving, um, Pharaoh tries to come and chase them down. And God begins to show them and try to wake them up more that I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing here. And the people, um, when they see this, they begin to be, they get afraid. And they start to, to say to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Like at least back in Egypt, we had shelter, we at least had some provision, but you brought us out here to die. And one thing that, that uh, Moses says, because he's trying to break the, con- you know, get them out of this consciousness of slavery that they've been under, is just stand still. And God will fight for you. Let me read it. It's in in this Exodus account. So they're leaving. He says this. It's interesting translations. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. Some translations say, the Lord will fight for you, for you, and you only have to be still. And that's a very important key in this time, because God is literally fighting for all of us. Always has been. And when we can be still, we begin to realize that we're not slaves. We begin to realize that creation itself works without our doing at a very core level. We don't even have to do anything. Creation will go on without us. But God wants us all to participate together. That verse right there will be essential for many people. Just be still. God is fighting for you. Now in the story, you know, we see this, the Red Sea, that they go through the Red Sea, it parts, you know, they go through. It's almost like a, it's a, it's a repentance, it's a baptism. It's a, it's a new thing, it's a new birthing, going through the birth canal. And they come out on the other side, you know, and the, the Egyptians are kind of, the, the waves wash over them in the story, and they drown their enemies. And, and God is essentially showing that, you know, I will fight for you, I will take care of these things. What's powerful about it is obviously the magnitude of the story is very supernatural. What often happens in stillness is that we become aware of a consciousness and a reality that is far different than our ordinary consciousness, our rationale, uh, our, our logic, especially in a time like this when we have idolized science, which is not all bad, but we have idolized science and the rationale and the intellect so much in the last 200 years. And a lot of that is beginning to crumble. But those who are still are able to hover over these chaotic waters. And there's creativity that comes forth to do life differently. In fact, what's powerful about this Exodus story is that it is 
it is uh, very similar in many ways. There's, there, it, it translates to the uh, Genesis account of the chaotic waters, right? The waters rising over the enemies, the chaotic waters, something new coming out and being birthed. See, in this time of stillness, if we can be still, we can hover over the chaos and begin to emerge as a new people, begin to emerge as new creations that can actually come into the world to serve, that it's not about survival, it's about otherness, it's about serving others and creating a culture that lives from rest, that lives from peace and joy and beauty and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. A lot of these dynamics that God has always placed inside us, but we're not still enough to know. So if we be still, we can know. And that's where we're at today. It's this new exodus. And so just be aware of the different pharaoh slave dynamics that always try to distract you and to pull you back into these narratives and stories that are not to be yours. We need a new narrative and a new story and there is a great awakening as we move into a brand new exodus. Now I want to share a little bit from this um, from Hebrews and actually I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. It's going to be with Hebrews 3. We'll start in there. And there's some beautiful things here because we see another exodus. You know, Jesus' life was another exodus. He basically replicates the uh, the Egypt story. You know, fled, f- flees to Egypt. There's a there's a ruler killing all the babies again, you know, trying to stop the promises. It's He reenacts the whole thing. And of course, just like human history, human consciousness, God is trying to wake us up to rest. And we're going to get into some some beautiful things. Uh, it's, it's getting exciting, but let's jump to Hebrews 3 after I sip some coffee. All right. So Hebrews 3. And so, dear brothers and sisters, you are now made holy, and each of you is invited to the feast of your heavenly calling. So fasten your thoughts and attention fully on Jesus, whom we embrace as our apostle and king priest, for he was faithful to the Father who appointed him in the same way that Moses was a model of faithfulness in what was entrusted to him. But Jesus is worthy to receive a much greater glory than Moses, for the one who builds a house deserves to be honored more than the house he builds. Every house is built by someone, but God is the designer and builder of all things. Indeed, Moses served God faithfully in all he gave him to do. His work prophetically illustrates things that would later be spoken and fulfilled. But Christ is more than a servant. He was faithful as the son in charge of God's house. And now we are part of his house if we continue courageously to hold firmly to our bold confidence and our victorious hope. This is why the Holy Spirit says, If only you would listen to his voice this day. Key point here. The Aramaic of what we just read can be translated, The Echo of His Voice. If only you would listen to the echo of his voice. And he goes on to talk about the Exodus story. Don't make him angry by hardening your hearts like your ancestors did during the days of their rebellion. When they were tested in the wilderness, there your fathers tested me and tried my patience. They saw my miracles and they still doubted me. And he basically goes on to say, because of this, they prevented themselves from entering into his rest. It's essentially what he says. Now, what's fascinating about this rest dynamic and this echoes of his voice and the echoes of Exodus, in this story, what God is actually trying to do, 
the whole story of, of Exodus with the plagues is all about a firstborn coming forth. It's about a son coming forth. And what that means is a collective body. That's why people in the Christian realm, we call it the body of Christ. The people, we are a body. We've been seeing this during this, this pandemic as people come together to, to serve for the medical community, to the essential people at, at grocery stores, to truck drivers. We're starting to see what is essential. We're starting to see that we are a human family. We're a human body. And God is constantly trying to wake us up to, to know who we are as sons and daughters, that we're, we're all actually sons and daughters. There is no one that is not a son or a daughter. There are people who live like they're not one. They're not awake to the fact that they are one. But this is the whole story. And that's why Jesus came to perfectly embody this, because it had never been done before, to perfectly embody this Exodus story so that we could pass through and, and die to these old narratives, these old understandings, and wake up and resurrect into this new exodus, this new story, this new creation that has always been available to us. And so this is very important. This is the whole reality of Jesus. It's not just for Christians. Christ is for all things. I mean, think about this. If you are a Christian, you've, you've heard this. Christ through whom all things were created. Christ who holds all things together. Think about the Apostle Paul. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even life, not even death, not angels nor demons, not even creation or anything uncreated. If you're not still, if you don't slow down to listen to these words, to hear the voice, the echoes of God, that's too radical for you. It's too much. And it still might be too much, but eternity was placed in our hearts. Every human heart has eternity in it. And if you slow down, come out of Egypt, come out of these cultural slave conditions, you can wake up to what Christ has been saying all along. Enter my rest. So let's get into that. So Hebrews 4. Now God has offered to us the same promise of entering into his realm of resting in confident faith. So we must be extremely careful to ensure that we embrace this fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. Just because you don't experience it doesn't mean it's not true. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did, yet they did not join their faith with the word. Basically, the people of, uh, of, uh, that were, you know, went through that exodus, many of them died. They didn't even get to enter the promised land because they just felt like they weren't good enough. They, they just complained and they grumbled because they were stuck into old narratives and old systems. They didn't embrace the new that was trying to be birthed. But I want to be very clear. They didn't even have to do anything. That's what's so weird about faith is that when you're still, you know things that works and performance and trying to muster up these things can never accomplish because it's already been done for you. Unbelief and not entering rest is only, it only comes by believing a lie. There's nothing you can do. Your behavior doesn't change it. Nothing can separate you from God's love. And so when you wake up to that, you enter the rest. But we're al we always, in our culture, are like, oh, I got to work and work and work and then I can rest. It's not God's way. That's not how we were designed. All right. So uh, it said, instead, they, they, what they heard did not affect them deeply, for they doubted. For those of us who believe, faith activates the promise. We simply rest in this realm of confident rest. For he has said, I was grieved with them, and they did not enter my rest. God's works have all been completed from the foundation of the world. For it says in the scriptures, and on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, as stated before, they did not, were not able to enter my rest. Those who first heard the good news of deliverance failed to enter because of their unbelieving hearts. Yet the fact remains 
that we still have the opportunity to enter into this faith rest and experience the fulfillment of the promise. For God has ordained a day for us to enter called today. For it was long afterwards that God repeated in David's words, Today, if only you hear and listen to his voice and do not harden your hearts. It's called today. Any teacher that teaches you how to be present to the present moment is teaching this rest. It is teaching the promise of God to be still. You don't worry about tomorrow as Jesus taught. You don't worry about yesterday. You're present to this moment because in the present moment, that's where eternity dwells. It's where this timeless dynamic exists in time, which is why God essentially uh, teaches the Israelites when they left the Exodus about Sabbath. Yet this exact thing says there is a Sabbath that remains. And this is what he goes on to say. Now, if the promise of rest was fulfilled when Joshua brought the people into the promised land, God would not have spoken later of another rest yet to come. So we conclude that there is still a full and complete rest waiting for us to experience. As we enter into this God's, enter into this God faith rest life, we cease from our own works, just as God celebrates his finished works and rests in them. So we must be eager to enter into this rest, seeing that no one falls short, believing that it is not available to them. So this uh, powerful dynamic is that all of these echoes of Exodus, all of these stories are always trying to get to this point, this process of rest. Now what's interesting to me is I recently saw somebody um, teaching about how when society collectively comes to like this crisis moment, when society comes to these moments, it's like we, we've come to the end of so many ways of doing things that we were unconscious to that we can either break down or break through. And I love that because this is where we're at. We can either break down or break through. And he made this statement that uh, when something new emerges, we see this in, in science and quantum realm, in physics and in life, when something new emerges, we don't know what it actually looks like. And that's why we need faith. We have to rest. We, we be still and we know. But he also made this statement. Be aware of, of not trying to look to an end state, but be aware of embracing the process. And I think that's wisdom for us right now. We understand that we're called to rest. But there is a process to help humanity forward and, and in this new exodus to come out of some of these old systems and come into this rest. And knowing that we're kind of in this middle ground right now, I feel like we've just left Egypt. And uh, what's to come is going to be Egyptians that are going to come down and say, no, 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 come back. Come back. you got to come back to the old system. Come back to the old way of our ec economy come back to these old no but I'm telling you no we must move forward we must come into this rest this promise of rest that is available to us and I'm reminded of a of a prophet his name is Bob Jones and he had uh, talked about this back in uh, the 70s maybe maybe even earlier and he had seen things every decade that God had showed him and he said the 2020s was going to be the decade of rest. This decade is starting. Look how it's starting. 2020 vision, um, Sabbath, being you know, forced into this Sabbath, into this rest of slowing down. And 2020s is this decade of rest. And he said there has been a people, or people up to this point have never entered this rest. And I think we're in it. I think we're finally there. We're finally going to get it. 
in this decade. And look at how it's starting. And then he went on to say that the 2030s was going to be a decade of unity. Well, we're already waking up. We have a long ways to go. But we're already waking up to how connected and interconnected everything is. In this time of social distancing, we are recognizing how connected we actually are. We are recognizing how important these functions of, of the body of humanity, the body of Christ, actually is. So we're moving into this rest dynamic. Um, another thing I want to share with you was a book that was written, I believe, in 1958 called The Sabbath. And I was reading this, uh, I read it a few years ago, and I really felt to, to pick it up again even before, I believe, before this virus dynamic hit America. And I, I read uh, Corona in this, and I thought it was so, uh, so right on time to, to this moment, and I'll just read it. It starts off like this. May the children realize and understand that their rest comes from thee, and that to rest means to sanctify thy name. To observe the Sabbath is to celebrate the corona. It's really the coronation. I don't know if you can see it. But it says corona because they used the hyphen because it was at the end of a, of a sentence. But there is a coronation, a crowning of rest. Remember what the plague meant for evil, God means for good. Whenever there's counterfeit of something, there's always the authentic. All right. To observe the Sabbath is to celebrate the coronation of a day in the spiritual wonderland of time, the air of which we inhale when we call it a delight. Call the Sabbath a delight, a delight to the soul and a delight to the body, since there are so many acts which one must abstain from doing on the seventh day. You might think I have given you the Sabbath for your displeasure. I have surely given you the Sabbath for your pleasure. This, uh, I read that on the first day of spring this year. And I just feel, again, the awakening of this moment. As people focus on all these kinds of narratives, conspiracy theories, you know, economic malfunction, things like that, we are to embrace this time. And I hope you have been. If not, it's not too late. Today, if you hear the voice, rest that this is actually something positive and powerful for our world. Think about uh, the people in, I heard in Los Angeles, who can now see the ocean from their house, where before they couldn't because there was so much pollution. Think about the, the life of creation that is coming back into uh, places, I think of uh, Italy, where they, they once were not and the water is becoming clear. What happens when you're still is the waters become clear. What is Psalm 23? He leads me beside still waters. We are in a worldwide stillness, a worldwide solitude. And this is a time when for many, the voices in their own heads and their anxieties come full circle. People aren't able to be still. But it is perfect time to just sit in that and to go through it. That is your exodus. Go through that process of leaving the Egypt and the pharaohs in your own heads and the pharaohs in your own lives who, who might be dominating you and controlling you through whatever job or non-job that you have. Follow that exodus into this rest, into this promised land. That is where we're going. Let me just read a few things. This book is quite fascinating. Uh, because it's so important to uh, what we're talking about. There is a realm of time where the goal was not to have but to be, not to own but to give, not to control but to share, not to subdue but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space the acquisition of things of space becomes our sole concern. 
One of the interesting things about the Exodus when the Israelites were leaving Egypt is that they were provided miraculously, but yet their lives were simplified. They didn't have all these things to carry with them. Think about the things in your life right now that you no longer need to carry. How can you rest, not be into the consumer mentality that has plagued us for so long? Some of the greatest plagues are not COVID-19. They're the addictions, the adulteries, the things that we allowed ourselves to get caught up in. In fact, the biggest plague is fear. And that's why God is always saying, fear not. Because what we do in times of crisis really brings forth what we really believe. And it's okay if we feel like we're failing. It's okay if we feel like we're dying. This is the moment for you to stop, to rest, to listen to a voice, the echoes of Exodus, and to hear a new story trying to emerge. Let me just read a few more things and and then we'll wrap up. There is happiness in the love of labor. There is misery in the love of gain. Many hearts and pitchers are broken at the fountain of profit. Selling himself into slavery to things, humans become a utensil that is broken at the fountain. The acquisition of things, the need for profit, what systems that demand profit are being exposed right now? What systems do you want to be a part of and what systems do you want to transform that could be more in line with rest and human dignity? Those are some questions to be still with and to sit with. Another, in fact, I'm going to post that video below this one the, the guy I was talking about that talked about not looking to a state but embracing a process. He, he also made this statement, in times like these we can come together and you know, figure out what is important. And there are things that are of higher reality than other things. And this was his example. Let's say people come together and they just, we, we all say, hey, we have just agreed that we no longer need oxygen. If that happened, we would die, right? It's like, why would you agree to that? There are ontological things right now that we should be focusing on that we need as a human family. But if everyone came together and said, you know what, this money thing, we don't think we need money to survive. We can still, we can still breathe without money. Creation will still go on without us. I'm not saying that overnight this can just change and everyone just doesn't use money. But it's a great example of how we can examine our world, how we can be still and rest and see what is actually important. We don't sell ourselves at the fountain of profit. We don't live our lives for money and things, right? We can simplify our lives. What good is it to gain all the success and the riches of this world and yet forfeit your soul? It's time to find what what is essential and not chase temporary things that we can't take with us when we die. We'll read this one. He who wants to enter the holiness of the day must first lay down the profanity of clattering commerce, of being yoked to toil. He must go away from the speech of dissonant days, from the nervousness and fury of acquisitiveness and the betrayal of embezzling his own life. He must say farewell to manual work, and learn to understand that the world has already been created and will survive without the help of man. Let me just do a few more. Technical civilization is the product of labor, of man's exertion of power for the sake of gain, for the sake of producing goods. It begins when man, dissatisfied with what is available in nature, becomes engaged in a struggle with the forces of nature 
in order to enhance his safety and increase his comfort. I think now is the time to realize that risk and our ideas of safety are not actually keeping us safe. I think about Jesus when he was tempted in the same way in the desert. He was offered power. He was offered wealth. He was offered the safety inside of a system if he just bowed down to it. What in our current systems around the world are offering us a false peace and a false safety? And then when, when crisis hits, we start to realize, like, I guess we don't get peace from this. This was all exterior. What, where's the interior rest and the interior peace? We need that because that surpasses understanding. That can transcend death and life. That can, can make sure that we are not separated from the love of God in our own consciousness. So we'll end with this one. In regard to external gifts to outward possessions, there is only one proper attitude, to have them and to be able to do without them. On the Sabbath, we live as it were independent of technical civilization. We abstain primarily from any activity that aims at remaking or reshaping the things of space. In the temp, to, to, to pen, I can't even say this word, in the tempestuous ocean of time and toil, listen, there are islands of stillness where man may enter a harbor and reclaim his dignity. On these tumultuous oceans of time and toil, there are islands of stillness where man may enter a harbor and reclaim his dignity. This is where we're at. Reclaiming our dignity. When Jesus passed through his exodus, through death, and then resurrecting into new life, people didn't recognize him. People close to him didn't recognize him. It takes a shift in consciousness to allow ourselves time to adjust, for our eyes to adjust, 2020 vision, to see what God is doing. And even when we get these pieces, to not cling to their forms. Jesus says something to a person who finally recognizes him. Do not cling to me. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended. Be aware in this time of moving out of your own exodus, whatever this means in your own life, to listen, to hear that voice, that you don't cling to some of the forms that emerge because the process is not done yet. Don't, don't look at things in, in looking at a, a final state, like I hinted with, that, with, with what that man was saying. Embrace this process from plague to promise. What is God saying to you? What new thing can emerge in this time? Be still. Pay attention to your heart. And listen. And let's see that we're in this together and see what can emerge through the chaos. Grace and peace and much love to you wherever you are. And may you find that rest and that truth that surpasses understanding that no outward circumstance can thwart. Much love.